and thank you for inviting me uh, in this uh, very impressive uh, session. Um, I've been asked to give presentations in uh, sessions for polycystic kidney disease patients, but that's always on a national basis. So in the Netherlands, I've also done in foreign countries, but such an international audience that's really new for me. And I'm happy to see that more than 300 patients from so many countries are, uh, uh, are uh, able to see these presentations. And I have been asked to give a presentation about polycystic kidney disease and pain. And my name is Ron Gansevoort. I'm chair of the Polycystic Kidney Disease Expertise Center at the University Medical Center Groningen in the Netherlands. And then you would perhaps like to know what Groningen is. Groningen is a little city in the northern part of the Netherlands. It has 200,000 inhabitants and around 30% of these inhabitants are students. So we're a very vibrant city. And I have uh, shown here a couple of... Uh, pictures of our hospital. This is the outside of the University Medical Center Groningen. It's already 20 years old, but when you look inside, it looks very modern and I'm very happy to work there. Pain in polycystic kidney disease, that's my topic. And pain, as you may know, is a common symptom in polycystic kidney disease. About 60% of all PKD patients in their lifetime will experience pain. It is related to the number of cysts, and therefore it's more frequent in patients with severe disease and patients later in life, because during lifetime, people develop more and more cysts, of course. It's also more frequent in women pain, and that is probably caused by the fact that women are more vulnerable to developing cysts in their liver, so that total number of cysts cysts in the kidneys and cysts in the liver count up and women have more uh, cysts and therefore also more prone to develop pain in polycystic kidney disease. And pain in PKD is sometimes and even often difficult to treat. It can be treated by medication and can be treated surgically and I'll come back to that later. There are two main um, forms. So Excuse me, Ron, to interrupt. Could the translators have asked if you could just move a little closer to your microphone? Okay. Is this better? I hope so. Um, there are two main forms of polycystic kidney disease, uh, of pain in PKD. Pain can be acute, so have a sudden onset. Fortunately, in case of acute pain, it's often of limited duration. And pain can then become also more chronic. And by definition, we speak about chronic pain when pain lasts for more than six weeks. And chronic pain can have several causes. It can be not polycystic kidney disease related. We should not forget that. And in many cases, pain in PKD patients is not PKD related, but it can also be PKD related. And then we've got two options again. It can be due to distension of the kidney. Around the kidney is a capsule. And when the capsule becomes distended, it can cause pain. And uh, enlarged kidneys can also compress tissue surrounding the kidneys and thereby cause pain. And I'll again come back to that later. Acute pain in polycystic kidney disease. I will cover that topic first. Um, causes. Like chronic pain, it can also be not PKD related. Don't forget that. But in case it is PKD related, it can be due to cyst bleedings or cyst rupture. And in that case, you have acute pain, blood in urine, sometimes fever, and fever can even reach 40 degrees Celsius. And these people have a preference to lay still. These are differences from kidney stones and from cyst infection. What are other causes of pain in polycystic kidney disease? Kidney stones, these patients also have acute pain, have also blood in urine, but these patients do not have fever. And these patients have such severe pain that they have a preference to move. So cyst bleeding, a preference to lay still, kidney stones, a preference to move. In case of cyst infections, most of the times it's not acute pain, but more subacute pain. Urine is cloudy because it's infected. 
There's pain on voiding and people have fever uh, ranging from 38 Celsius to 40, 41 Celsius. So these are the four causes of acute pain in polycystic kidney disease. Treatment of acute pain can be symptomatic with painkillers. Of course, there is an order in which we start medication. First, we try paracetamol, in some countries called acetaminophen. We can also use NSAIDs, uh, and these are uh, painkillers like ibuprofen, fultaren, uh, neurofen. Kidney patients always think that they are not allowed to use these drugs, but when PKD patients still have quite good kidney function, there is no contraindication against these medications, especially not when you want to use it for only a short period. And it's far better than morphine-like drugs because morphine-like drugs, even when you use them only for one week, there can already be a chance of addiction. Symptomatic treatment are painkillers. Symptomatic treatments are also antibiotics in case of a urinary tract infection or a cyst infection. Besides symptomatic treatment, we also have treatment of the underlying disease severity. So treatments that can delay the development of polycystic kidney disease. And there are now two classes of drugs available, somatostatin analogs, for instance, lamreotide or octreotide, but these are only used in patients with severe polycystic liver disease and chronic liver-related pain. The other option are vasopressin blockers, and vasopressin blockers, you probably all know, the most uh, well-known drug in this class is tolvaptan, but that should only be given in patients is frequent acute kidney-related pain. So somatostatin analogs for liver-related pain, especially chronic, and vasopressin blockers for acute kidney-related pain. And here you see the evidence for tolvaptan. And this evidence was generated in a large-scale trial, the TEMPO trial. This trial included approximately 1,450 patients with polycystic kidney disease with relative early disease. And patients were given the drug tolvaptan or placebo and were then followed up for three years. And at the end of follow-up, 18% of placebo-treated patients had an episode of acute pain whereas on tolvaptan it was only 12%. So there was a 36% reduction in acute renal pain events with tolvaptan in this trial. What uh, 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 tolvaptan did so um, independent of patient characteristics for predisposing for kidney pain events. So it was similarly effective in women versus men and similarly effective in subjects with and without previous kidney-related pain. Tolvaptan was also equally effective independent of the severity of pain. We um, hypothesized what the mechanism might be of the effect of tolvaptan on acute pain events. Um, we thought that yeah, tolvaptan works because it delays the growth rate of the polycystic kidney disease, but that's unlikely the mechanism of action of the effect of tolvaptan on acute pain. Because in patients experiencing, and those patients not experiencing kidney pain, there was a similar growth rate. So there might be something else. And we think that the likely explanation is um, the telvoptan causes less kidney stones and less urinary tract infections. And we noticed that with telvoptan, there were around 30% less kidney stones and 30% less urinary tract infections. And that is caused by telvoptan leading to a very high urine volume, six to eight liters of urine per day. And this results in less urinary tract infections and less kidney stones. So that enormous urine volume washes away bacteria, thereby uh, leading to less urinary tract infections. And it also washes away uh, any kidney stones that are perhaps being formed. 
The first part of my presentation was about acute pain and I now switch to chronic pain. And chronic pain has been a uh, neglected topic in the treatment of patients with polycystic kidney disease. And for that reason, we developed in Groningen, the place where I work, a novel stepwise approach to treat chronic pain. And the aim that we had is that we would like to develop an effective standardized protocol for the treatment of chronic pain and to preserve kidney function. Because what often happens when patients have severe chronic pain, that there is a need to remove a kidney. And when you remove a kidney, you lose, of course, kidney function, meaning that the moment that people will be uh, dependent of kidney function replacement therapy becomes earlier than without the removal of a kidney. So we would like to have an effective treatment uh, with preservation of kidney function, so by avoiding the need to remove a kidney. And in our protocol, patients are eligible when they have PKD-related pain, and PKD-related pain should be present for more than three months. And they should have a FAS score, and FAS is an abbreviation of visual analog score, and zero is no pain, 100 is the most extreme pain, and they should have a FAS score of at least 50 out of 100. And that chronic pain should also be important for patients. It should be invalidating. So influencing social life and or leading to an inability to work. And eligible patients should also use opioids. What we do in our protocol is that we have a multidisciplinary approach. Patients are screened not only by a nephrologist, but also by a pain specialist. They all get per protocol standard measurements of blood, spot urine, 24-hour urine. But we do also imaging of the kidneys and the liver by MRI or by CT, and we do rhinography. And after we have screened these patients, so we have taken a very careful history, we've got also the images. These patients are then discussed by a multidisciplinary team. And in this team is a nephrologist, so a specialist in kidney diseases, a pain specialist, a radiologist, urologist, hepatologist, and when needed also a transplant surgeon or a gynecologist. And then we try with all these people present to define a patient-specific solution. And here you see where all patients come from. They are, we are working here in the northern part of the Netherlands in Groningen, but you see that our patients are referred from all over the Netherlands to our place to be treated. And in some individual cases also from Belgium and from Germany. And now I would like to discuss with you how our protocol looks like, and I'll do that step by step. This is the first step, and this first step is always already done in the centers that refer patients to our pain clinic. When patients have chronic pain, and it is not directly ADPKD related, they should, of course, receive standard therapy as appropriate. When there's chronic pain, patients should get non-pharmacological treatment, for instance, physiotherapy, and they should get the standard pharmacological treatment. And that is the three-step analgesic ladder. So first paracetamol, and then opioids, or in some cases, NSAIDs. When this part is done, we take it one step further, we come to the minimal invasive therapies. And the minimal invasive therapies can be kidney related or liver related. When we look at the images on the CT scan or MRI and we see one very dominant cyst or perhaps two or three very dominant cysts, what we can do is cyst aspiration. So take out fluid out of these cysts or make a kind of hatch in the cyst so uh, that when the cyst makes fluid, it drips out of the cyst. And here I show you a picture of a 48-year-old woman, this especially cyst in the liver, of which one very large cyst in the liver. 
Here on the right side, you see her MRI picture. And this is her kidney, multiple cysts, one a little bit larger, but not very impressive. This is the liver. And here you see one very dominant cyst. And that's on the top side, on the head side of this patient. And here on the right side, you see a picture um, that um, like, um, this is now the front side of the patient. This is the back side. You see again that this one liver cyst reaches from her back to her front side. So an enormous cyst containing 1.5 liters of fluid. And what we can then do is aspiration of fluid, often just a temporary effect because the cyst will fill itself again. But when we have proven that it is effective, then there is an additional need for sclerotherapy. So we, we inject something that, um, that the cyst stops forming fluid or we make that hatch in the cyst that when the cyst makes fluid again, it will leak out to the uh, outside of the uh, cyst. When there are no dominant cysts, then we have defined something new and that's specifically for our protocol in the Netherlands that we apply all kinds of nerve blocks. And then there are various nerves that can be blocked. Um, and I'll show you in this cartoon, and this cartoon is far too complicated, even for a doctor, it's a complicated uh, cartoon, but the important message is that the nerve supply of the kidneys and the organs is complex in the upper abdomen, and that the nerve supply of the capsule surrounding the kidney goes here, to the central nervous system. It's different from uh, the renal parenchyma uh, that has a different routing of nerves, but the organs in the upper abdomen, including the liver, they are um, supplied by nerves that follow a completely different routing. But we can take advantage of this new knowledge how the nerve supply of the kidney and the other organs in the upper abdomen is by applying diagnostic blocks. And what we first do is a diagnostic block of the celiac nerve. And we do so with a local anesthetic. A local anesthetic is like lidocaine that the dentist uses. It works only very temporary. Patients have to lie on their belly. And then we enter with a long needle and then just beside the backbone, there, there are the nerves in green, and we can uh, paralyze them temporarily with that local anesthetic. And remarkably, it is effective. In two thirds out of the patients, it is effective. And in these patients that it is effective, we have a temporary effect that lasts uh, uh, for a couple of hours or a couple of days in 50%. The strange thing is that although we use lidocaine that only works for a couple of hours, there's a long lasting effect in the other 50%. And that's very surprising for us. But we think that the nerves are irritated and that they behave like having chronic pain, whereas there is no chronic pain anymore. And when you paralyze that nerve for only a couple of hours, that nerve becomes is in a normal state and doesn't fire anymore. But when pain returns after such an effective celiac block, we can block the splenic nerve and we do that in a different way with radio waves, effective in 85% of cases. And then it's long lasting, it works for 1.5 to two years. And when needed, when pain returns after two years, this procedure can be repeated. When these blocks, the celiac block or the splenic nerve block are not effective, then we can block the nerves of the kidney. Um, I'll uh, skip this slide, also a little bit um, uh, complicated, but we can enter the aorta with a catheter, look for the renal artery, and then via the renal artery, ablate the nerves that surround the renal artery. 
and that also works quite well. So here you now have the total protocol that we have designed, first starting by excluding non-polycystic kidney disease related pain when it is polycystic kidney related disease related. Then we've got the non-pharmacological treatment options, the pharmacological re uh, options. We've got the minimal invasive therapies, first looking for dominant cysts. When there are no dominant cysts, we can do this nerve blocks in case of kidney related pain or liver related pain. And when all these options are not effective, only then we go to invasive therapies in the case of uh, kidney related pain and nephrectomy, or in case of liver related pain, a liver transplantation. And the results are quite good. We have now studied uh, more than 100 uh, patients. They've got uh, various treatment options in our protocol. And removal of kidneys was only necessary in seven patients. And in five of these seven patients, they were already on dialysis. So we took out an afunctional kidney. So we did not shorten the time to start dialysis. Here you see now the results. This is the visual analog scale. Score of zero, no pain. Score of 100, extreme pain. And here you see in, in uh, individual patients, this is a so-called spaghetti plot. So one line represents one patient and the red line is the average. And what you can see that before the treatment, they had a pain of 60. Shortly afterwards, it decreased to 20. Longer term follow-up, there was a slightly increase in pain again. But that's also because when we were looking at the number of morphine-like drugs that people were using, um, that that was um, decreased by 60 to 70%. So there was a decrease in the feeling of pain and we were able to uh, withdraw morphine in uh, many of our patients in any way leading to a lower dose of morphine. And that brings me to my conclusions. In PKD, pain is quite frequent. Pain can be acute related to kidney stones, cyst bleeding, cyst rupture, or cyst infection. Patients should be reassured that in case of acute pain, pain is in most times temporary and rapid adequate pain control should be pursued. Please note that although NSAIDs um, have a bad name, they can be used during short periods of time, especially in patients with still preserved kidney function. Pain can also be chronic, in that case related to distension of the capsule covering the kidney or related to compression of tissue or organs surrounding the enlarged kidneys. And especially chronic pain is often difficult to treat. And what we added to the current management is that nerve blocks can be of help to achieve adequate pain control and to avoid the need to remove a kidney. And in my opinion, treatment of chronic pain should preferably be performed by a team of interested and skilled people of various professional backgrounds. So not only by a nephrologist, not only by a pain specialist, but they will include also a hepatologist, gynecologist when needed, radiologist, et cetera, to have the best treatment option for an individual patient. So that should be done in a specialized multidisciplinary polycystic kidney disease clinic. And I also would like to acknowledge the entire team that is working in our uh, pain clinic. And now uh, I'm happy to uh, address any questions when there are questions. Thank you very much indeed, Ron, for that very clear presentation and for, for showing us the difference in particular, I think, between the acute and the chronic pain that uh, many people are affected by. We did have a few questions related to treatment uh, of using either medical marijuana or the CBD, the, uh, the cannabis, cannabis oil products. Uh, I know it's a very popular topic on our internet forums. 
Yeah, and uh, I know that patients with uh, chronic pain, invalidating pain, sometimes use uh, uh, these drugs. Um, and I do not know of uh, studies, but I know of individual cases, and some of these patients are very satisfied with the results. Um, there's always, of course, the fear of addiction. Um, but I think um, when you use low dosages, and sometimes people can also use it during short periods of time, it can be really helpful. But even in cases when you have seen your nephrologist and a pain specialist, they're not able to do something for you, this might be an interesting option. Thank you. We had a question about nerve blocking, which you've described as being available in your center. Uh, do you, do you know if it's available in other countries? Uh, yeah, those Europe? nerve blocks are normally done by anesthesiologists uh, in pain clinics for other uh, diseases, um, like the celiac block or the splenic block is normally uh, done for patients with cancer with very severe abdominal pain, especially pancreatic cancer. So in nearly all larger centers, the pain specialists can perform these blocks. Um, but they have never done so in patients with polycystic kidney disease. And they are also not very familiar with the disease. And mm -hmm. they, they, they have no feeling for these patients that the pain can really be severe and that the blocks they normally give for cancer patients, it is a good treatment to also use them in patients with PKD. So it's worth asking your doctor. It's surely worth asking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And uh, somebody had asked about distinguishing kidney related pain from other type of pain. I think that's uh, something that many patients will struggle with when going to a primary care doctor, for example, uh, with a pain. How would we know the difference? Um, yeah, we have to, to look at other causes, especially lower back pain or back pain, muscular pain will also uh, happens quite often in patients with polycystic kidney disease. But the description of pain when you take a careful history is so different um, that uh, it's quite easy to make a distinction between musculoskeletal pain and pain related to the kidneys. Making a different um, difference between kidney related pain and liver related pain, that's quite difficult, especially when it's right sided. Um, but that is also not that important but because the nerve blocks that we apply work for both liver-related pain and kidney-related pain. Um, but most important is to exclude other causes of pain. Cholecystitis, appendicitis, people are very ill. That's not a chronic pain. When a chronic pain, we often see patients that have for years already uh, pain, then I know already for sure that there's not something else ongoing because that would have been clear already for a long time. Thank you for that. So that uh, brings an end to the question and answer session. And uh, we're now going into our break. So thank you very much indeed, Ron. And thank you also to Beatrice and Leanne for their earlier talks. And uh, please, everyone who's attending, rejoin us after the break for the final two sessions of the day. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon.